Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about Star Trek. Uh, now, you may know that i am uh, always been a bit more of a Star Wars fan than a Star Trek fan, so perhaps some of my internal biases are going to be showing in some of my evaluations in this video, so you'll have to forgive me that. Uh, I will say, however, uh, that I certainly do enjoy Star Trek. It's not uh, its not that I don't like it, it's, uh, it's just my preference is for a, uh, a different type of uh, sci-fi, more the space opera sort of thing than the, uh, the Roddenberryan vision of the future. And that actually plays into the subject of this video, because the subject of this video is the Prime Directive, which is a key component of Roddenberry's vision of the future as a sort of secular, humanist, modernist utopia. And so what we see is the use of the Prime Directive um, throughout most of uh, Star Trek, particularly in the original series and in The Next Generation. We see it as more like a plot device than it is an aspect of world building. And that's because we find it to be well, an ethical problem, which is going to be uh, essentially the thesis that I'm going to be putting forward in this video. Because we, the audience, understand that there are problems with this idea of non-interference with pre-warp, or in other words, primitive civilizations. We do understand, of course, that there are circumstances under which we would, we would and should want to interfere with other civilizations when we have the capability of helping, for example. And so, what this leads to is... Uh, the Prime Directive, more often than not in the original series and the next generation, especially being a barrier that our heroic captains have to overcome. They have to try and help anyway, despite this, uh, this directive telling them that they can't. Now, this is all well and good in terms of it being a, uh, a plot device, because it works excellently as a sort of antagonistic force that our main characters have to, uh, have to reconcile with. However, once we get to the prequel series of Enterprise, which is the focus of, uh, of my discussion for this video, we start having to justify what we see as Federation policy in the original series moving forward, particularly the Prime Directive. And so this, uh, this comes up especially in a first season episode of Enterprise called Dear Doctor. This was quite early on in the series when it was still sort of finding its footing and it was still doing a more or less episodic format with a new adventure, a new trouble, a new, uh, a new thing to do each episode. And in this episode, we find um, a situation where the crew of the Enterprise uh, encounters a pre-warp civilization who are encountering problems. And the ethical dilemma of the episode is whether they should help or not, and what might the consequences be of them helping or not help. So, <clears throat> we see from this, uh, ultimately, I will argue that, well, the show's intention with this episode is to show where the Prime Directive comes from, show that this ethical dilemma can be uh, uh, theoretically resolved by a policy of non-interference with primitive civilizations. Now, it's worth noting that when I say primitive civilizations, these are spaceflight-capable. Uh, this is a spaceflight-capable planet. They have a level of technology uh, further advanced than our own today. However, they are still certainly uh, comparatively primitive when, uh, when compared to uh, even Earth at the time in the 22nd century of, uh, of Enterprise. They're certainly pre-warp. And that, of course, being the cutoff point for uh, the cutoff point for uh, the Prime Directive. Warp capable, you can interact with them because they're capable of expanding out on their own and encountering civilizations on their own. However, if they're not warp capable, that means that they are to be left alone in their little pocket of the universe. So the purpose of this episode, as I said, is to provide a sort of ethical justification for the Prime Directive, or to give us a reason to think about why the Prime Directive might have been established. In fact, we have Archer at the end of the episode, uh, near the end of the episode, I should say, uh, giving a sort of speech about, well, someday there ought to be a directive. Someday, my people are going to come up with some sort of a doctrine, something that tells us what we can and can't do out here, should and shouldn't do. 
But until somebody tells me that they've drafted that directive, I'm going to have to remind myself every day that we didn't come out here to play God. And from this, we see that uh, this is meant to lead into uh, the original, uh, the original series, and the policies of the Federation that we all know and perhaps love. Um, in any case, unfortunately, what we actually see in this episode, over the course of this episode, and its ethical dilemmas, is an ultimately wrong and inhumane decision being made for reasons put forward as uh, evidence for, or arguments for, the Prime Directive. So, brief summary of the episode. Uh, if you uh, if you haven't seen this, or if you haven't watched Enterprise, this is one that you can watch more or less on its own, and I actually recommend watching it. Uh, it is a very good episode, uh, because it does explore some fascinating topics like this. Uh, and it's got some good character work, particularly for, uh, for Captain Archer. Uh, as well as for Dr. Phlox, who is the sort of perspective character uh, of this episode. Phlox being a Denobulan and uh, another alien who has been spaceflight capable for a very long time. Uh, and so he knows his way around uh, around the galaxy, or at least this corner of it, relatively well compared to humans who are just starting off in, uh, in their journeys into space at this point in time. And so... He has a bit of a condescending attitude towards humanity and towards more primitive civilizations. In fact, the episode begins with Dr. Phlox uh, examining and uh, and caring for his various pets uh, who he uses for medical research and for medical purposes and also takes care of them and such. This to me sort of gives us um, a thematic insight into the episode because again if you if you study symbology or uh, or anything about symbolism in literature you should always look at how a piece of literature begins and it will sort of reveal its thematic structure in that beginning whether it's told well or if, or if it's not told well usually intentionally or not intentionally the start of a story will tell us what it's about and i think that this tells us that this is about seeing ourselves as ethically superior, of greater moral significance to other primitive cultures and primitive civilizations. Even if that's the opposite of what they're intending to do, even if that's the opposite of what the Prime Directive is intending to do, that is certainly the effect, that is certainly the attitude that is, uh, that is behind this kind of a policy. So, we... We find Enterprise encountering um, a member of the species called the Valakians. Uh, and they live on a, as I said, a planet that is pre-warp. So it is uh, a highly advanced civilization, more advanced than humanity. It's, they seem to have things like anti-gravity technology. They have incredibly advanced uh, medicinal and computer systems and all sorts of things like this. Uh, they are what I would say is mid to late 21st century. Probably... Um, at least by Star Trek standards, uh, probably something equivalent to uh, Earth just before World War III, something along those lines. But what is interesting about, uh, interesting and perhaps troubling about this planet, is that there are two sapient species. Uh, one, the Valachians, are the dominant species. They tend to be significantly more intelligent, and they hold the dominant place within the society of the planet. The other species, called the Mank, are very similar, um, both physiologically and genetically, but they seem to be sig significantly less intelligent than the Valachians. And they seem to coexist more or less peacefully. Now, the show does have, uh, and this is a bit of a a bit of an, an aside here, but it's something that I feel I need to mention, because it's, a, it's, it's another indication of um, the odd modernism of uh, of Star Trek and the odd, perhaps, misunderstandings of, of, uh, of social theory uh, that Star Trek is sort of prone to, it, it shows and it describes the, the peaceful interaction between the Valachian and the, the Valachians and the Mank uh, as a kind of exploitation, but a paternalistic exploitation. 
But the Valachians allow the Mank to live and to work and to produce and to, to do it, what it is that they do. But realistically, they are the productive people. The Valachians, the higher civilization, are the productive people. They have all of the productive resources. They have the most fertile land. Uh, they don't allow the Mank access to these productive resources or productive land. But instead, they just provide for the Mank, the, these lesser people. And of course, this is really rather silly, um, as uh, particularly it ignores uh, some very fundamental sociological and economic principles. That of, for example, comparative advantage. So if you have a an underclass population, a, a different species, the Mank, which are uh, are capable of learning and capable of acting and capable of doing things and capable of therefore presumably producing, even if they are strictly inferior to the Valachians at those various tasks, they may still be, it, it overall, economically speaking, may be more efficient and is almost certainly more efficient, really, for them to perform tasks that the Valachians are comparatively uh, comparatively less suited for, and leaving, uh, sort of freeing up Valachian labor for intellectual pursuits that they're more suited for. Again, this is the doctrine of, com uh, of comparative advantage. It's an economic principle. It is, it is, bared out, it is borne out by all sorts of data and analysis, um, as well as uh, sort of a priori uh, analysis. Um, I'll, I'll link something in the description as well for, uh, for more on this. Uh, on this principle. But of course, this completely uh, ignores it for the sake instead of, uh, of putting forward this idea that, that there's a paternalistic sort of a relationship between the Valachians and the Mank. Which again, is a bit ironic because it seems as if that is the sort of relationship that the Proto-Federation, the humans, uh, as well as uh, as the Vulcans and the Denobulans present, that is the way that they also seem to be treating uh, those they see as more primitive or lesser civilizations, like the Valachians. Now, I digress. Setting aside the entire issue of uh, of comparative advantage and setting aside the issue of uh, of this this interspecies relationship, onto the actual conflict of the episode, which is that the Valachians are being ravaged by a disease. The Mank, by contrast, seem to be immune to said disease and are therefore helping. Uh, as best they, they can uh, to uh, to help treat Valachians when possible, uh, doing menial tasks, but still helpful tasks. And it turns out through study that uh, through through studying this disease over the course of the episode that the crew of the Enterprise is particularly particularly Dr. Flox um, come to learn a good deal more about this disease and then also come to come to learn that they could in fact treat this disease very efficiently, very effectively with minimal effort on their part. Now, the disease is not a bacterial or viral infection or anything like that. It turns out it is a genetic degradation. It is, an, it is a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, a genetic disease that is, uh, that is slowly but gradually killing off the Vlachian people. Uh, and by Dr. Flox's estimation, they would be completely extinct within a couple of hundred years. Just due to continuous genetic, de genetic degradation. They were effectively an evolutionary dead end, as he puts it at one point in the episode. This is where things become rather interesting, because this is where uh, Dr. Phlox begins to argue uh, with Captain Archer that they should not be interfering with this disease that is going to wipe out a species. His reasoning is roughly along the lines of the Prime Directive that it would be wrong to interfere with the natural development of the civilization on this world. That the Menk seem to be far more capable, uh, or at least have a good deal of potential, uh, to learn and to develop. But that they are... Uh, they're incapable of realizing that potential while they are uh, while they are sort of under the thumb of the Valachians. Uh, and while the Valachians uh, have... I'm going to use my own term here again, an economic term, that they are being crowded out by the uh, by the, uh, the the civilizational superiority, let's say, of the Vlachians. And so, um, Vlox's hypothesis is that if the Vlachians are allowed to die out, that the Menk, over the course of the next several several thousand years or so, will develop into a uh, into a uh, more highly evolved species, 
uh, a more intelligent species and will uh, eventually form their own civilization in the ruins of the Wallachian civilization, presumably, and may even develop beyond, develop further, and develop to the point of uh, of interstellar travel and, and effectively become members of the galactic community on their own. Of course, over the course of several thousand years and over the course of dozens or hundreds of generations, and of course, over the course of generations and generations of suffering, including the deaths of every member of the Valachian species. Now, why would he consider this? On its face, the way I've described it, this seems to be, I think, at least I hope, <laughs> intuitively, we should think that the right thing to do is to help the people who are dying, even if that means that this other civilization may not develop over the course of the next few thousand years. However, um, Blox has a line here near the end. I'll play it if I can, if YouTube will allow me to. I'm not sure it would be ethical. Ethical. We'd be interfering with an evolutionary process that has been going on for thousands of years. And I've seen evidence of increasing intelligence, motor skills, linguistic abilities. Unlike the Valachians, they appear to be in the process of an evolutionary awakening. It may take millennia, but the Mank have the potential to become the dominant species on this planet. They need an opportunity to survive on their own. All I'm saying is that we let nature make the choice. The hell with nature. You're a doctor. You have a moral obligation to help people who are suffering. I'm also a scientist, and I'm obligated to consider the larger issues. But I believe your compassion for these people is affecting your judgment. My compassion guides my judgment. Uh, that, as a scientist, he is obligated to consider the larger issues. And what he means by larger issues are evolutionary concerns, considering species as such. Considering the Valachian species as an entity, the Menk species as an entity, rather than having any particular concern for those particular Valachians who are suffering and dying, and those particular Menk who will suffer and have a, a, a significantly decreased standard of living, let's say, over the next several thousand years, as Valachian civilization crumbles out from beneath them, can no longer support them, and when they have not gotten to a point yet where they are capable of developing to the point of of upholding the existing civilization because clearly at this stage that they're not that's the whole point that's what he's getting at here the doctor's getting at so he takes this natural process of evolution to be a uh, not just a descriptive principle but a normative guiding principle that it ought to be allowed or it ought to be followed or ought to be obeyed or it ought to be enforced even that the crew of the enterprise would be interfering with something that he seems to be describing as good and holy if they were to save the Valachians from painful and horrible death and ultimately extinction because it seems that he has a kind of a view of uh, of evolution as a, as I said, as a normative force, but as having sort of teleological purposes, being guided towards a particular end, towards a particular end state, that being the death and destruction of the Balakians and the gradual, slow, and ultimately painful evolution of the Menk. This, I think, really, more than anything, speaks to the, the flawed sociology, the flawed anthropology, and ultimately the flawed ethics that, that is at the core of sort of Roddenberryan, um, the sort of Roddenberryan vision of Star Trek. Because it, first of all, as I mentioned, considers species, groups, as primary, <clears throat> and only considers individuals as strictly secondary. That an individual person, say an individual suffering Valachian, a Valachian suffering from this horrible disease, which, notably again, is entirely curable by Dr. Flox. He could deliver a cure uh, that would not only alleviate the suffering of the individuals, but would allow them to continue on their to continue their civilization and without fear of this genetic degradation. 
being rather being concerned rather with the species as, as a whole and its sort of natural genetic trajectory, natural in the sense of what will happen according to uh, according to uh, sort of evolutionary forces, rather than natural in terms of what is uh, what is what is in accordance with the nature of the thing itself, or the creature, or the person itself. By prioritizing the direction or the flow of the species, both species, as species, rather than looking at the individual Valachians and the individual Mank, what we find is a sort of ethical inversion, a kind of concern for the thing which is ultimately less important because it's ultimately less real. The uh, What Aristotle called secondary substances, these collections of individual things that have qualities in common, right? they, they are... Uh, they share characteristics, they share traits, they share even essential traits. But the thing, the collection, is not itself a thing. It's not a substance. It's not as real as the real Valachian who is suffering and the real Menk individuals who will have uh, a substantially worse life. Now, the other element of this <clears throat> is a kind of prioritization of equity. Because there's a heavy implication throughout the episode, and this is secondary as far as Phlox is concerned, but it's certainly a, uh, a factor that the humans on the crew consider pretty strongly, that they take this relationship between the Mank and the Valachians as an inequitable relationship. That the Valachians, because of their uh, their genetic superiority, not to use a nasty buzzword, but quite straightforwardly, their superior intelligence, their their higher society, and etc. All of that. They see the they see their power over the Mank as unnatural and as wrong, uh, as a kind of uh, as a kind of an affront to the dignity of the Mank. And so what we see is that, uh, what, what, with the implication, I suppose, uh, or what we're meant to see from this episode, is that if if the Doctor and ultimately the crew of the Enterprise were to help the Valachians, to cure the Valachians, it would be, in some sense, at the expense of the Menk, because they will still retain their inferior position in society. Now, there are all sorts of problems with this as well, first of all, because, no, that's not actually the case, um, because the Menk have an sort of unnaturally, in the sense of uh, evolutionary biology, an unnaturally elevated standard of living because they live harmoniously with the Valachians. They have a higher standard of living than they would as a uh, sort of pre-sapient or slightly sapient or extremely primitive um, species. They have currently a much higher standard of living and will continue to have a much higher standard of living if they are living harmoniously with this superior civilization, even if the species does not fully develop and fully evolve uh, its own uh, potential capabilities. They still, each individually, would have a, a significantly higher standard of living going forward, and that doesn't even stop um, if the Menk were to eventually, in theory, develop a, uh, a highly advanced society and join the galactic community and everything, because presumably the Valachians would have long before and brought the Menk along. So the so the the negative effect on the Menk by curing the Lockians would only possibly be comparative. They would be in an inferior position to the Valachians, but not in an inferior position to themselves or the potential versions of themselves without the Valachians. This is a problem, this is a very common problem with taking equity to be uh, an ethical goal. Because if you have, just, just a brief little illustration, if you have people at two separate levels of, say, wealth or comfort or anything, wealth for simplicity's sake, you can create equality by making both parties poorer. But that doesn't make anyone better off, clearly. In fact, it makes everyone worse off. But if your goal is equity, you might be uh, you might be better served by making everyone worse off. You might also say 
that if equity is your goal, making everyone better off, but making certain people more better off would be a bad thing, which is certainly ridiculous. Uh, that that is not a preferable scenario because again, people are not uh, people are not better off in such a scenario. Uh, this is the uh, the level. This is what's called the leveling down objection to egalitarianism, and it's a basically a fatal flaw in uh, in egalitarianism as an ethical goal. A good analogy to this, a, a relatively precise analogy to this, uh, in terms of. Uh, in terms of, say, medically helping people of uh, of in unequal social status, might be um, so. Objecting to Phlox's cure for the Volachians is relevantly similar to if someone were today in our real world to object to a proposed cure for skin cancer, because skin cancer more often affects uh, Caucasian people than African people, and so. Uh, by curing this particular disease, you're helping a people group which is already better off, and so therefore comparatively at the expense of people who are comparatively and historically worse off. This is, of course, absolute nonsense for two reasons. First of all, no one is harmed by the curing of skin cancer. Obviously. But then second, and I think more fundamentally... By helping some people, we are helping everyone. Because we are we are allowing people to, one, help each other in the simplest sense, but then also freeing up resources for other more worthy goals. If we can simply and easily say cure skin cancer, that means that medical research for other, other problems suddenly opens up and suddenly becomes a possibility. Similar things can be said about this situation, the, the situation of the Balakians and the Mank. If you can, in fact, cure this genetic disease of the Valachians, they suddenly are no longer spending significant amounts of resources on curing and treating this apparently untreatable and uncurable disease. But rather, they can now allocate those resources to improving their own society, which will then improve the lot of the Mank as part of that society. A rising tide lifts all boats, as they say. So this is, I think, uh, both of these errors, this, this, egalitarian issue, this egalitarianism issue, as well as this issue um, having to do with um, uh, having to do with treating groups as fundamental, are both key to the ethical issues with the, uh, with the prime directive. But there's also another, and it's something I've been alluding to and sort of hinting at, and it's been thematically present throughout this episode and throughout our discussion, but it's not explicit in any, in any of their reasoning in the show for, uh, in this episode at least, for why we should have something like the Prime Directive, uh, a non-interference clause. And it's also especially relevant to people today who insist that we ought, we meaning developed advanced Westerners, ought not to interfere with other civilizations and other cultures that could be helped by us. And it is the idea uh, that other cultures as such have some value in their own ways and their own uh, their own natural development as a culture, as a people, as a group. So this is very closely tied with that first problem, the problem of looking at people groups as groups, as as secondary treating secondary substances as real substances. But this is a particularly modernist way of looking at different differing people groups as having as only having value insofar as they are a coherent people group, and that including that includes ourselves. This this is the uh, the view that Western civilization is is a uh, a particular outlook on the world, and it has value insofar as it is a unique and particular outlook on the world. But it's no greater or no lesser than any other outlook on the world, whether that is ethically or even epistemologically, which of course is simply cultural relativism. And that, I think, is at the core of something like the Prime Directive. Because the insistence is upon avoiding what they call cultural contamination, the emphasis is not upon helping people develop, helping people to live better. The emphasis is on the 
the growth of a particular culture as a culture, even if that culture is uh, wrong in some ways, or wrong in other ways, or something, or if something could be taught uh, to the members of this culture, say, by a more advanced civilization, whether that's technologically or philosophically even. It's a kind of lack of confidence in oneself, in one's own civilization, or a failure to take one's own ideas seriously, to take uh, to take one's ideas as true and therefore worth spreading and worth disseminating and worth explaining to others. It's born out of a laudable kind of respect for the ideas and the views of others, but it becomes a problem, it becomes an ethical problem in particular, when it leads us to dismiss our own ideas, and therefore to dismiss the ideas of others as relatively unimportant. Only being important, that is, uh, in the context of their being ideas held by somebody, rather than their importance being, uh, being founded upon their being true, or even candidates for truth. Truth doesn't really factor into the question at all. So I think, hopefully, uh, I've done a bit to show a uh, bit of an issue with uh, Star Trek's Prime Directive, or at least my issue, my issues, I suppose, plural, with Star Trek's Prime Directive. The kinds of, uh, the kinds of uh, philosophical outlooks that lead to this kind of uh, this kind of policy are the wrong kinds of outlooks. They're the kinds of outlooks which uh, which are very fundamental to this. Uh, to this Roddenberryan, uh, secular humanistic, uh, utopian future that leads me to, to eh, like Star Trek a bit less, perhaps than uh, than some other sci-fi than some other sci-fi franchises and and, uh, and worlds and settings and such. That's it. The issues are explored uh, in a great deal of depth, as evidenced by my capability of talking about uh, this issue in particular simply on the basis of one particular episode of one spin-off series of the show, uh, rather than even going into any of those uh, the TNG episodes or the, uh, the original series episodes that actually deal directly with the Prime Directive, which we certainly could. Um, but to look at it from this origin point <clears throat> shows, first of all, that the, the writers actually, at some point at least, cared about, uh, about the, uh, the, the world building here. Uh, in this context, looking at why things are the way that they are and how they developed into the ways that they are. But I think looking at that, it exposes some problems in the fundamental philosophical outlooks uh, like we've been looking at. So before I ramble too much more, thank you all so much uh, for joining me. I hope that uh, I hope that we've uh, had a bit of a fruitful discussion here, and I hope that this goes somewhere else. So feel free to comment down below what your thoughts on the Prime Directive are uh, on this episode, on how uh, the how the various aspects of the worlds that we uh, that we like to inhabit in our fiction how those aspects might come to be and how they might develop in this way and if there are other examples that we can look to of uh, of this kind of thing where we see the development of an idea that has been around for uh, that, it, that seems to have been around since the franchise's origin but looking at why and seeing if we can find a particular philosophical origin point for it whether good or bad or a combination of both anyway Thank you all again. I'll see you next time.